All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. We have the um, Southwest Florida Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. The event we're having today is the First Amendment, Social Media, and Section 230. We have with us here today Professor Eugene Volek. Professor Volek is the Gary T. Swartz Distinguished Professor at Law at UCLA School of Law, where he teaches First Amendment law and, among other things, has a First Amendment um, amicus brief clinic. Just Professor Volek clerked for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor at the U.S. Supreme Court and Judge Alex Kaczynski on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Professor Volek is a member of the American Law Institute. And finally, he is the founder and co-author of the leading legal blog, The Volek Conspiracy, which um, my, I might add, uh, my wife is a, a big fan of. Um, and also Professor Volek is a double UCLA Bruin in addition to his teaching there. So good luck tonight with the basketball game against Michigan State. Um, we also it have nothing to me. <laughs> I don't care enough. about sports. In fact, I'm against it, at least uh, college sports. Fair enough. Um, we also have with us um, Baron Soka. Mr. Soka is the president of Tech Freedom. Prior to that, he was the senior fellow and director of the Center of Internet Freedom at the Progress and Freedom Foundation. Mr. Soka received his Juris Doctorate from the University of Virginia. After that, he clerked for the Honorable H. Dale Cook, a senior judge at the United States District Court for the Northern District of Oklahoma. In practice, Mr. Soka worked at Latham and Watkins and another boutique firm in Washington, DC, where he focused on internet and telecommunications. Um, so, Thank you all both for joining us here today. We're really grateful that you would um, take the time out to talk with us. Uh, like I said, our discussion here today is free speech, First Amendment and social media. And I think the, um, the biggest, I guess, first point we have is, is one more important than the other? Is it, is it the First Amendment or the Section 230 that we need to focus on when we're having this debate regarding social media. Um, Baron, is that well, something? I'll, I'll take that to start, and I'll just mention uh, two things that you didn't mention in my bio. Uh, one, I'm starting the right. Eugene Volek fan club, because uh, I've been a great fan of Eugene's work for over a decade. There is no law professor in America I respect more, and Eugene, uh, Eugene knows a lot more about the First Amendment than anyone, including me. And as you'll hear today, I think most of our disagreement is about uh, how the facts apply uh, rather than the law. Uh, but it's just an honor to be uh, discussing this with Eugene and to get to do what I uh, tried to do. Second thing I would add to my bio, I, I ran the uh, speakers program at the UVA Federal Society. And I always tried to do what the book of Isaiah calls us to do, which is uh, come, let us reason together. And I'm, I'm really excited to be doing that today. I think that's exactly the kind of conversation we'll be having instead of the usual conversation, which involves people uh, misrepresenting both Section 230 and the First Amendment. Uh, that's that's not what you're going to hear today. You're going to be you're going to hear a lot of uh, discussion of some some hard questions about the law and, and how the, the the nature of social media uh, will be uh, uh, determinative in how the law applies here. So, to answer your question about Section 230, I would just start by saying uh, that this this debate is very confusing to many people uh, because it, Section 230 does two very different things. And uh, mostly people think about Section 230 uh, as uh, ensuring that websites are not held liable for content that they host or provide access to, like search engines, for example. Uh, and uh, and that, that's the debate about sex trafficking and opioids and, and so on. Uh, and in that respect, uh, Section 230 changed the common law. That was the whole point of the law. There had been two prior court decisions that said that websites would become more liable if they tried to moderate content, uh, or an earlier decision that said that uh, websites might be held liable as distributors if they uh, knew or had reason to know of unlawful content. And in that respect, Congress uh, superseded the common law and said, uh, no, that, that creates a perverse incentive not to moderate, and it would make the development of interactive computer services very difficult, not impossible. 
So Congress changed the, the common law. That's, that's the, the first thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, that Section 230 uh, protects websites uh, from being sued for decisions they make to moderate content, to, to withdraw it, to hide it, to, uh, to take it down, whatever that might be, to ban users. Uh, and in that respect, uh, Section 230, in my view, uh, doesn't change uh, the law. It simply uh, extends uh, what would have been the uh, application of the First Amendment anyway, but it provides a uh, essentially a civil procedure change. It says that you don't have to litigate those difficult and extremely expensive to litigate First Amendment questions, and you can instead simply file a motion to dismiss under Section 230 and get the lawsuit uh, dismissed. And that, that, of course, is a huge change. It's essentially kind of tort reform. Uh, it says that uh, you don't have to uh, to do this asymmetrical warfare where it's very very cheap to file a complaint, but it costs a lot of money to to defend against uh, a case. And, then, and now this this is the functional um, dichotomy in how two thirty operates. And most people, including some very smart lawyers, assume um, when they understand that they assume that the statute neatly maps onto that distinction, and they read the statute and they say uh, section C one talks about not being treated as a publisher. And section C2A says uh, you can remove content. Uh, so therefore, uh, the dichotomy, the functional dichotomy uh, maps onto that uh, that d distinction between those two sections. And that's not the way the statute uh, was written or intended or has been interpreted by the courts because section 230C1 says you're not to be held uh, liable or treated as a publisher of information provided by another or, or as the speaker. And uh, the courts, uh, starting in 1997 and consistently since then, in every decision involving these cases, have held that what it means to be treated as a publisher uh, is both to, to put up content, to host it, and also to withdraw it. In other words, uh, content moderation is covered by both of the key immunities in Section 230, C1 and C2A. And the difference between them is when they apply. Uh, C1 only applies if you're not responsible for creating content uh, that someone else uh, has, has posted, uh, whereas C2A uh, is, a, is a backstop uh, provision that applies even if you did help to create it, even if you edited it and uh, became responsible in part for, for creating it and then decided to take it down. So uh, that's the backdrop against which we're having this conversation. And I say all this to say that that, that is the, the, the legal source of a great deal of legal confusion. But if you understand all of that, uh, I, I think you reach my conclusion, which is that um, even if you repealed Section 230 today, uh, yes, uh, the dynamics of litigation would change radically. Yes, uh, websites would be very hesitant to moderate content. But ultimately, if they were willing to, to go through the expense of litigation, the, the substantive outcome on content moderation wouldn't change because the application of the First Amendment uh, would, would be the same. And so that's why to answer your question today, I think it's it's constructive for us to talk about what the First Amendment would mean here and whether a state or the federal government could pass laws that seek to compel websites to host content they don't want to host, even in the absence of Section 230. And my answer in a nutshell is no. And Professor um, Bullock, do you feel the same way? Yeah, so I, I uh, agree uh, uh, largely, or in fact, probably almost entirely with what Baron had said so far. And by the way, let's let's do it on a first name basis. I, Baron and I, I think, call each other Baron and Eugene. So please feel welcome to do the same. Um, so uh, uh, here are the two relevant provisions. Uh, do you folks see the section C1 and C2 on the screen? Mm, no, I do. Yeah. Didn't share? Okay. So C1 says no provider or user shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. So that's why if somebody sues Twitter because I supposedly have a libel, libelous material that I posted via Twitter on the Twitter servers, they can say, hey, we're immune from liability because you're trying to treat us as a publisher or speaker of Volux information if you're trying to sue us for libel. Section C2 says no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be held liable on account of any action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access to or availability of material that the provider or user considers to be 
offensive in various ways or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. So here's an example. Let's say somebody says, well, Twitter, you blocked this account. And we think you blocked it because of its religious message. We think we blocked it because it was, let's say, a pro uh, Falun Gong message, let's say, or pro uh, Sikh message or something like that. And we think that under state public accommodations law, like maybe California's UNRU Civil Rights Act, that violates the, your duty to treat your users equally without regard to religion. At that point, uh, Twitter isn't being treated by the law as the publisher or speaker of information. In fact, the whole premise for liability under this public accommodation statute would be that it's not a publisher or speaker, but that it's a place of public accommodation, that it's a host, that it's a platform. Um, uh, but it would have immunity under 230C2 because it says, look, we restricted it because we thought it was offensive for various reasons. We consider it to be otherwise objectionable. That's very strong uh, uh, protection for us, a very broad protection. And therefore, we're entitled to immunity from this uh, state public accommodation statute. Now note, these state public accommodation statutes uh, may not even apply in this situation under state law. And if they do, they apply to only a very limited range of editing decisions, chiefly ones based on religion, maybe or sexual orientation. In a few states, maybe political affiliation, but only a few, few jurisdictions, mostly cities. Um, so, so the thing about 230C2 is it hardly ever actually makes a huge difference because there's no cause of action, state law cause of action usually to be trumped by 230C2, because usually uh, uh, platforms are entitled to eject whatever speakers they want because under state law, it's their property, they're entitled to do that. But even if state law purports to, uh, uh, to restrict these platforms powers, uh, section 230 would preempt that state law. Uh, now, maybe later on, we'll get to some creative and maybe successful, although let's say long shot arguments as to why 230C2 might itself be preempted by the first amendment. But 230C2 is generally speaking, does provide very broad preemption of state attempts to require equal access, let's say, or uh, uh, to uh, platforms or to treat platforms as common carriers. So that's why generally speaking, uh, if there's going to be a move to really restrict uh, uh, platforms in an effective way, that is to say, restrict them in the sense of restrict their ability to kick someone off based on their uh, speech or based on their viewpoint, they would probably have to be done at the federal level. There are some state laws being proposed. And again, there are some arguments as to how they can evade 230C2, but as a general matter, section 230 does indeed uh, entitle platforms to, just, to pick and choose what material to host and what not to host. So with that, I think then we really need to turn our discussion to the, the First Amendment. And at this point, for all of our attendees out there, um, this is going to be an interactive conversation. So there is the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to, to pose questions to our panelists as we, as we engage in this discussion. Um, and they will answer them as they're um, or going through our discussion here today. Um, so, Baron, like you said, it seems then, and like Eugene said, we need to focus on the First Amendment. And as we were talking um, today and hearing what you said in your opening, it seems like you're focused on um, the government should not be able to or cannot impose restrictions because these social media companies are private entities, right? Uh, not, not only are they private entities, but they are private entities that, uh, that produce a, a, an expressive product. So they're not like uh, a shopping mall or, uh, or, or some other uh, store. Uh, they are, or they're not even like uh, cable providers or the telephone company. Uh, they are in the business of providing a community that is curated. And that's exactly how they hold themselves out to their users. Uh, so I, I'm a telecom lawyer by training. I, I do a mix of telecom and, uh, and speech law. Uh, and, uh, and the difference to me uh, is very stark. So we've spent much of the last uh, 15 years debating net neutrality. Uh, but, but the fundamental point about net neutrality and the reason ultimately that the 
uh, 2015 order was upheld in court uh, is that the FCC's rules that required uh, no blocking or throttling, um, those rules only ever applied to, to services that held themselves out as providing connectivity to uh, the entire internet, that held themselves out as not blocking or throttling. And in that sense, uh, that, that's, uh, that kind of common carriage regulation in, in the common law is a kind of consumer protection. It ensures that uh, consumers are getting what they are promised. Uh, and ultimately, uh, what the DC Circuit said when this was challenged and, and Judge Kavanaugh then uh, made a First Amendment argument saying that the rules violated the First Amendment rights of the broadband providers, uh, the judges who had written panel decision uh, in explaining why the DC Circuit on Banc uh, refused to rehear the case uh, said, uh, look, uh, companies can, broadband companies can, can opt out of these rules. They could, they could make a different uh, disclosure. They could uh, change the nature of their offerings and make clear up front that they would uh, uh, block or throttle, that they wouldn't provide connectivity to the entire internet. Uh, and and if, you, if you understand that that's the baseline, that, that it takes very little to opt out of that status, uh, you then have to ask, uh, well, uh, how different is Twitter, say, from Comcast? Uh, and the answer is fundamentally, because Comcast says we will provide you connectivity to the entire internet. Uh, Twitter and Facebook and every other one of these services uh, says uh, we create a community. It's very important to us that uh, we don't allow hate speech and misinformation and fake accounts and so on. Uh, and it's inherently subjective as to how we uh, apply those uh, terms of service. And the entire debate we're having is about that exercise of editorial discretion and what uh, is being proposed at the state level and Congress in one way or another is an attempt to supersede the uh, editorial control of a private media company over a, uh, a production that, uh, that has a, a collective expressive content for which they are held liable. And, and this is when I said at the outset that a lot of what Eugene and I disagree about is, is about facts. Uh, this is what I, what I mean. So uh, he'll, he'll point to cases where uh, the court has, uh, has noted that, um, that children understand that schools might be compelled to say certain things and that children don't hold schools responsible for that. Uh, well, that, that's, that may be true. That may be true of law schools when they're doing recruiting, that uh, law students uh, understand that the government is compelling uh, the military uh, to be allowed to recruit on campus. Um, but uh, but it's, it's very clear that every social media site uh, is held responsible by market forces uh, for the overall content of their service. And we have to look uh, uh, no further for that than what they say to their investors. I mean, they start their investor calls, just for example, in the fall, when they put when Facebook put out its uh, fourth quarter uh, earnings report, uh, it started its investor calls, excuse me, third quarter, right before the election, um, talking about their efforts to deal with misinformation uh, and abuse of their service, um, because they said uh, they are held responsible for that. And their, their uh, SEC filings say uh, our reputation can suffer because of these things. And we try very hard to manage uh, content on these services. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, they, that's them saying market forces uh, judge us by the content that is on our service and how we moderate it. And my position in a nutshell is that the government can no more intrude upon that than it can intrude upon the rights of a newspaper to make the same sort of editorial decisions or a parade organizer to decide who, what kind of signs can be carried in its parade. Um, so uh, I wanted to, to, again, put up a little slide with so that we can quickly go through some of the key cases because this is really, uh, this is indeed a matter of uh, maybe the facts, but maybe kind of how you characterize the facts. Which which box do you fit? Um, do you fit uh, uh, the facts into? So so let's uh, uh, let's uh, share. Let me share this slide here. Um, uh, let, let's look at how hosting obligations uh, are treated by the law. So. There's a case, Miami Herald v. Tornillo, a very famous case, which says a newspaper can't be required to publish replies to criticism of candidates. Um, and uh, uh, that is, that's an important free speech protection. So even if a state law does say this, and of course, most states don't, don't require that even in the, in the first place, but if it does say that, that violates the newspaper's First Amendment rights. Because in part, newspaper is all about what it, what it excludes as well as what it includes. We often read a newspaper beginning to end, 
and you trust its editorial judgment to present to you the, the material that uh, that uh, uh, it thinks is worthwhile, even when it's passing along material from third parties. Likewise, in Hurley, the parade case, uh, the court held that a parade organizer can't be required to include floats and dislikes, again, in part because a, a parade is viewed as sort of a coherent whole. People often go and watch a whole parade beginning to end, or at least a chunk of it. On the other hand, in the Pruneyard case, the court said a shopping mall may be required to allow leafleters and signature gatherers. Now, I would imagine that a late 1970s California, before the California Supreme Court announced that requirement uh, the, of, uh, that it imposed on shopping malls, many people might have held shopping malls account responsible for allowing leafleters that they disapprove of. Um, uh, they might have complained to the shopping malls uh, because people generally expect that private property owners are responsible for what is done on their property. Uh, but notwithstanding that, the Supreme Court said that the uh, that um, the uh, uh, California law could, if it wanted to, impose this requirement uh, of equal public access on large shopping malls, uh, and that if the shopping malls wanted to respond to, to, to people's, uh, or not even respond, but, but but if shopping malls were concerned that people might think that, that leafleters and signature gatherers are endorsed there, they could simply put up a disclaimer. Turner Broadcasting, the court likewise held that a cable system may be required to carry broadcast channels. The cable system didn't want to, wanted to carry the channels that, that it had, uh, uh, that, that it preferred, but no, the, the uh, Congress said you must also carry uh, broad, uh, the broadcast channels as well, and the Supreme Court said that that's constitutionally permissible. And then in Rumsfeld v. Fair, the court said a private university may be required to allow military recruiters. Now, Rumsfeld involved a funding program, but the way the court upheld it is it said, look, even if this were a total mandate, not just a funding condition, but a, a categorical mandate, university can be required to allow military recruiters. Now, universities actually did have pretty serious objections to the presence of the military recruiters, not so much, I think, because the universities were pacifists, but because they were against the military's don't ask, don't tell policy, which discriminated based on sexual orientation. Uh, and I'm sure many university students demanded that the universities exclude these military recruiters. Nonetheless, the court said it's permissible for, um, uh, for the government to uh, require uh, uh, universities to allow such recruiters. Now, what's the difference between the first two cases and the last three cases? Well, here's a line that I think captures things well from Hurley. And I do think that Barron is right. It shows that when we're talking about platforms, we're in a somewhat new scenario. We need to figure out where, where to, to uh, place the platforms in, in these precedents. And you could argue that they are more like one or more like the other. So in Hurley, when the court was explaining why a parade can't be required to include floats, but a cable system can be required to include channels, Court said the programming offered on various channels by a cable network. By network, they meant a cable system, not like a network like ABC or ESPN. Consists of individual unrelated segments that happen to be transmitted together for individual selection by members of the audience. So the theory is the parade is this coherent whole. People watch the parade, and if you require the parade to include floats that the parade organizers don't approve of, it's now a different parade. On the other hand, a cable system you know, there's channel two, channel three, up to channel 99, let's say. Uh, and people tune into channel two to see what the, to what, uh, uh, what that channel wants to show you, then channel 50 to see what that channel wants to show you and the like. I'm inclined to say that when it comes to basically the, the hosting that, uh, 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 the, the hosting of a particular, uh, um, uh, particular, uh, um, uh, uh, account, let's say, a particular user's uh, feed, um, uh, the um, uh, Twitter is more like the, uh, the, the cable company, Twitter, Twitter, just to take an example. Uh, an even clearer example would be WordPress, like blog, uh, a blog hosting software. That would be very much like the uh, hosting company. Twitter is a little bit mixed. So let me, let me share just uh, the page with, uh, with, my, with my Twitter feed. So there you have it, Vala conspiracy. On the left, this is all my stuff. 
this is people tune into it. If they go to twitter.com slash Voluxy, or if they, subs- if they subscribe to the feed on the app, they're looking not for Twitter's message. They're looking for my message. On the other hand, look at the right-hand side. What's happening? Well, that is Twitter. Now, it's not Twitter itself writing all those headlines, but it's Twitter selecting what it wants to promote to people. So I think that as to the right-hand column, Twitter does have First Amendment rights to decide what to include and what not to include. Just like Pruneyard, the shopping mall had every right to put up signs of its own or not put up signs of its own in places where it was speaking. So it could put up a big Merry Christmas sign and decide not to put up a, a Happy Hanukkah sign. Uh, I think that would be its, its uh, uh, First Amendment rights. But when it came to people going onto the property and expressing their own views, even using, the, uh, using their property, uh, using uh, the shopping mall's property, then it could be compelled to host it because it wasn't being compelled to speech. Likewise with Rumsfeld v. Fair, although with Rumsfeld v. Fair, if anything, the university, the kind of the right-hand column is even bigger. The university uses its, the university property overwhelmingly for its own speech and for the speech of people that it selects. Uh, it is entitled to decide which uh, classes to teach, which classes not to teach. Uh, it's entitled to decide uh, which, uh, 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 which messages to express as the university's messages. It's decided, entitled to decide whom to invite for university-sponsored lecture series. As to that, it has free speech rights, which the court in Rumsfeld acknowledged, and it has rights to be free from compelled speech. So if the university says, we will refuse to invite anybody from the military to uh, give a graduation speech or even give a guest speech in one of our lecture series because we disapprove of the military's policy, it would have every right not to do that. But when it came to deciding who can speak uh, in um, uh, the, the classrooms or interview rooms during recruiting season, uh, that was seen as the, uh, uh, as the speech of the recruiters and therefore the university could be required to host it. Likewise, I think this left-hand column or maybe the middle column, that's my speech. Uh, now, under current law, it's my speech on Twitter's property and Twitter has every right to kick me off. But if Congress wanted to say that that column is essentially, you are like, you are a common character. You are like uh, the cable system in Turner. You are like the university uh, in, uh, uh, in Rumsfeld v. Fair uh, being required there not to allow all speech, but allow the government speech. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm inclined to say that in that respect, this middle column is really a lot more like, uh, um, uh, a lot more like the uh, um, uh, the speech uh, of the cable, excuse me, the property of the cable system, the property of the shopping mall, the property of the university, where this really is individual segments that happen to be transmitted together for individual selection by audience members. Now, of course, one difference is they're not quite as unrelated, right? Twitter makes it easier for to people to forward things, for things, for comments to appear and such. So that does raise interesting questions at what point certain kinds of relationships are enough to make it Twitter's coherent speech product. But I think as to that middle column, uh, and the same thing with regard to Facebook pages, the same thing with regard to uh, blogs hosted at WordPress, the same thing with regard to videos on YouTube, that is more like Turner rather than like Hook. Well, this is the essence of our disagreement. Uh, and, and as I say, it is, uh, it is largely a disagreement about facts. So let's, uh, let's just rewind to, uh, to Rumsfeld. So uh, I think Eugene did a really nice job of summarizing uh, the, the different things that a, a university can and can't be compelled to do. Uh, well, the most important thing to know about Rumsfeld uh, is that the court clearly held uh, that the, the thing at issue there, recruiting, uh, was not speech. That the, that the regulation was a regulation that was uh, primarily of, of conduct. Uh, and the court said that the uh, any regulation of the university's speech was, quote, plainly incidental uh, to the Solemn Amendment, which is what required the school to do that. Um, to the extent that the university had to speak at all, what it was being asked to do uh, was to um, state uh, when the recruiting happened, uh, what room to go to, how to sign up for it. Uh, in other words, the compelled speech there uh, involved statements of fact entirely. Um, 
And and most importantly, uh, the court said that um, this potential for confusion that we've been talking about didn't exist there because they said that um, uh, not only what I mentioned earlier, that uh, students uh, understand that schools can be compelled to do certain things, uh, but also they said that uh, a, a law school's recruiting services lack the expressive quality of a parade, a newsletter, or the editorial page of a newspaper. So the question is, uh, is, is, is that true? Is any of that true here? And, and my position, again, is that, uh, that what uh, Twitter and Facebook do uh, is essentially no different from a newspaper. It is functionally uh, different. It works differently. But of course, uh, we understand that, uh, and Eugene's written about this better than anybody, uh, that the First Amendment uh, applies uh, regardless of distinctions, that it's, it's not a protection for the institutional press, as he's written. It's a, it's a functional protection, and it, it really protects uh, the exercise of editorial judgment. Um, so what, what did the court say uh, in Rumsfeld about Pruneyard? It said, uh, we, we explained that there was little likelihood that the views of those engaging in the expressive activities would be identified with the owner of the shopping mall, who remained free to disassociate himself from those views, and who was not being compelled to affirm a belief in any governmentally prescribed position or view. Uh, okay, so uh, a shopping mall uh, isn't in the speech business. It, it, it's, it's incidental uh, whether speech appears on its, uh, on its property. Uh, and yes, uh, it may have been true in, in that time that uh, some customers would have complained about it. Um, but the shopping mall wasn't, for example, uh, telling its investors on its, uh, its quarterly calls or the Securities and Exchange Commission that, uh, that its brand value, its, uh, its income stream, uh, depended on its reputation. And its reputation depended on how it moderated speech. Um, that, that's what social media sites do. And, and, that, and they do that because they are in essentially the same business as newspapers. Both, both business models involve uh, relying on advertisers to be willing to put uh, a commercial speech about their products next to uh, the non-commercial speech that, the, that is the, the mainstay of that platform, whether it's a newspaper or a social media site. Uh, and, uh, and what we're really talking about here is whether a, uh, a, a social media site is going to be compelled against its will to carry speech, not just that it finds repugnant, uh, but that its users find repugnant, uh, users who may leave the site and go to another site because of the way that that site handles speech or may decide not to use social media in general, uh, but also advertisers. Uh, we are now seeing uh, investors bring shareholder suits against uh, companies like Home Depot and major advertising companies, companies that handle $36 billion of advertising for leading brands, uh, their investors. Uh, are, are, are trying to get them to stop putting money into sites that don't do enough to moderate hate speech or misinformation uh, or, or, or what have you. So to me, uh, these sites are as different from uh, Prune Yard uh, as is a newspaper. Uh, and, and now the question is, what do we make of Turner? Because I agree that that's a, that is a, a, a very, uh, that, that is ultimately the, the, the only relevant case. And when I say that, what I mean is, Common carriage traditionally, as I said earlier, under the common law, common carriage is all about the nature of your offering to the consumer. If you hold yourself out as serving everyone indifferently, you are a common carrier. And as the court said in um, Midwest video, uh, in that sense, you, you don't compel someone to be a common carrier. You just recognize the nature of their offering. What's different about Turner is that it, it is essentially an effort uh, to impose a kind of common carriage mandate, a must carry in that sense, uh, upon a provider for some other reason. And in that case, the reason was uh, the concern that that provider had gatekeeper control. So, so let's, let's note first that what the court meant there by gatekeeper control wasn't monopoly power. Uh, the court in Miami Herald uh, had dealt with arguments about monopoly power uh, and, and arguments I think that are much, much stronger than arguments about social media today. It wasn't that uh, Facebook and Twitter are really big and they're problematic. It was that uh, many markets in America in the 1970s, uh, even as is true today, uh, had only one newspaper. And also that newspaper maybe controlled the radio station and those were the only media outlets. So that was it. So they, you know, they literally had control over all the content that you could get. And yet the court said that didn't change the first amendment analysis that newspapers uh, regardless of their, their market power, had the same First Amendment rights. So what's different about Turner 
is that in 1995, uh, 1994, the court says uh, that the cable operator has gatekeeper control that is fundamentally different because there was only one wire that went into the home that was capable of carrying a multi-channel video programming service. This was before uh, satellite television existed. So that was it. You either you either subscribed to cable or you just relied on uh, over-the-air broadcasting to get a few channels. And, and in that sense, uh, the court said, yes, uh, that, that gatekeeper power is sufficient uh, to justify uh, the imposition of must carry to say that you must carry broadcaster signals. But of course, the court, the court only got there because it was applying intermediate scrutiny. Uh, if, it, if it applied strict scrutiny, that clearly wouldn't have been uh, a sufficiently compelling argument. Uh, and one of the reasons that the court applied uh, uh, intermediate rather than strict scrutiny uh, is that um, no one in that case argued uh, that um, the cable providers were objecting based on content. The intrusion upon editorial discretion in that case uh, was simply that the cable providers were being denied the ability to uh, configure uh, the, the uh, programming package in the most profitable way because they could carry only so many channels and for each broadcast station they had the channel uh, to carry, they couldn't carry say the golf network or whatever. Uh, and so that's what that case was about. They didn't object based on any of the content of speech because what they were being asked to carry was broadcast speech. So it was already policed by the uh, FCC for indecency, heavily sanitized for their market reasons, et cetera. Uh, the situation today uh, with social media is fundamentally different from both of those things. Uh, whatever one may say about uh, social media sites, uh, they have market power, just like newspapers may have had market power. They don't have gatekeeper control. They're not the only way you get programming into your home. And then second, the, the, the debate about editorial discretion isn't just a debate about configuring programming packages and what's most profitable and so on. Uh, that, that is a, if you will, a less important uh, form of editorial discretion than what we are talking about here, which is that social media sites don't want to carry what they consider to be hate speech, misinformation, uh, efforts to suborn an election, whatever. And they want the editorial discretion. They want to exercise their First Amendment right to decide where to draw the line about those things. And, and, and the idea that they should be compelled to carry speech that they find reprehensible uh, just because of, uh, of market power or because uh, of, of whatever, uh, I, I think uh, misapplies Turner. And I will just con conclude with this, which is um, Eugene knows more about the First Amendment than I do. And I, I, will, never, uh, I will never dispute him on, on cases. Uh, but I will question his, uh, his characterization uh, of Twitter into breaking down neatly into, uh, into two columns. Uh, because Twitter, uh, and I say this as somebody who spent the last uh, 13 years on Twitter, uh, Twitter is uh, an interactive experience. Uh, and when you go to Eugene's, uh, to the Vault Conspiracy page, you're, you're, you're not just seeing uh, the, the links and the posts that, that Eugene puts up. Uh, you're seeing all the other content that's posted in, in replies and the back and forth. And that interactive conversation is not very different from the conversation that we're having here today. And, and I would say that uh, you, the Federalist Society, have the same First Amendment right to decide uh, which uh, two people got to participate in that conversation, uh, the Twitter has to decide who gets to participate in the conversation and which things can't be set, just as you could bleep out certain words that we say, or you could edit down this recording before you post it online. Now, is oh, there, go ahead. I'm sorry, I just wanted to, to, to respond to that, and then I, we'll have plenty of time, or at least we'll have some time, I think, for, for Q&A, and I'll be happy to answer your question. But I just wanted to speak a little bit to, to this, because I think uh, that uh, uh, if not quite everything, but almost everything that Baron said about uh, uh, about um, uh, this, the Twitter as a speaking entity, Twitter as a place for speech, is also true of universities, right? Universities also speak. In fact, that's what universities predominantly do. Universities are also not monopolies. Uh, much less so there are they are even in their own niche generally speaking than twitter or facebook but certainly they're not monopolies they're certainly not monopolies from a perspective of uh, uh, of uh, uh, employment interviews so lots of other ways that uh, uh, that uh, military can recruit people um, so rumsfeld had to deal with this kind of situation it also had to deal with the reality that uh, you many people 
really seriously objected to the presence of military recruiters. The universities did, many of their stakeholders did. Of course, not shareholders, because they don't have shareholders, generally speaking, but donors, right? So one question is, would Rumsfeld have come out differently if the university said, look, we have donors who are really upset at this. We, they think that by allowing recruiters, even, even under government compulsion, we would be endorsing an anti-gay agenda. They're threatening to withdraw their donations. We have evidence of calls in which we were telling them about how gay friendly we are and how hostile we are to anything that's not gay friendly. I don't think the court would have said, oh, well, in that case, of course, the universities are perfectly free uh, to, to exclude the recruiters. In fact, the court went through this in considerable detail. It said, look, the schools say that they could be viewed as sending the message that they're fine with the military's policies if they allow it. But we rejected that similar argument in Premier because there was little likelihood, not no likelihood, but little likelihood that the views of those engaging in the expressive activities would be identified with the owner, in part because the owner is free to dissociate himself from those views, could put up little signs or whatever else, wasn't being compelled to affirm a belief in any governmentally prescribed position or view. And as we see later on in the last paragraph, because people appreciate the difference between the speech that a school sponsors and speech the school permits because legally required to do so. That if indeed some donor calls up and says, I'm withdrawing my donation, I'm not giving you any more money, I'm not paying for a wing, I'm not letting you name your school after me, or you can name it, but I'm not going to pay for it, um, because I'm so upset with you, um, uh, with you allowing recruiters. The school would be entitled to say, at least under this hypothetical, which the court was discussing of uh, the school being actually legally mandated uh, uh, to, to uh, allow the, uh, uh, the recruiters, the school would be entitled to say, look, uh, uh, we're, we're not sponsoring it. We're only allowing it because we're legally required to do so pursuant to an equal access policy. Surely, although maybe they put it more politely, you haven't lost the ability to appreciate that difference. And presumably, indeed, most donors would say, well, all right, you know, it's not your fault that you have to allow these recruiters. So, so that's fine. I'll give you the donation. And if they say, nope, nope, I refuse to donate any money to, to you because recruiters are allowed, well, that's kind of too bad. That's not a reason. For the, it's not a First Amendment argument that the school can give uh, for refusing to allow these uh, um, uh, uh, to allow recruiters on, onto its property. So the school is very much a speaker, even more, or perhaps let's say as much as Twitter is a speaker. And the school is also uh, 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 providing a, a, a platform on which others can speak. And the government, the court said unanimously in Rumsfeld, is entitled to institute an equal access policy, even a, a weird equal access policy there, which gave a special provision for, for, uh, uh, for government speakers, but, uh, uh, but the same would be true uh, applying Pruneyard to a broader equal access policy, notwithstanding the fact that some people may dislike those speakers, as again, people certainly did in, in Rumsfeld, because you could explain to the public that you're only allowing them because you're legally required to do so. I think this logic applies every bit as much to Twitter. Uh, so, it, um, I'm sorry, Barry, if you want last word, it's great, but I just, I also wanna make sure we have time. Yeah, if I may, if I may have uh, one one last word with uh, with screen sharing, if you could turn off yours, I'll just share one. Sure, one sure, absolutely, absolutely. Rumsfeld. You can uh, screen shares. So, yeah, well, uh, we can't duel. So, so to me, the key line here that we, we haven't discussed is, um, is this. Uh, accommodating the military's message does not affect the law school speech because the schools are not speaking when they host interviews and recruiting receptions. In other words, the yeah, everything you say is true. The schools have lots of expressive functions, but the court said re recruitment is not one of those expressive functions. And my point in a nutshell is that uh, telling uh, social media sites what they can and cannot host is essentially like telling uh, the, the uh, university uh, what it may or may not do in its expressive functions. So for example, um, uh, employment discrimination laws can be enforced online, right? That's more like recruitment. That's about the, the conduct, about how uh, non-discrimination works in, in recruitment on LinkedIn or, or on Facebook or whatever. Um, but when I read this paragraph, uh, that seems to me to be uh, exactly different from what we're discussing here today. Uh, and then second, 
uh, on the question of disassociation. Uh, the court went out of its way again and again to say uh, what was important there uh, and what was important in Pruneyard uh, was the ability to disassociate yourself from, from other speech. And, and my view is that um, uh, that's actually, if anything, it's more difficult online, um, not only because the expectation uh, is uh, that these services are responsible for, for content, uh, contrary to, for example, cable systems. Uh, the court noted in Turner that uh, cable systems had long carried speech and users uh, didn't think that use, that the service was responsible for it, just as we don't think that uh, getting a, uh, an obscene phone call is the responsibility of the telephone network. Uh, I think the user expectations clearly cut differently in the case of social media. But on top of that, it's actually very difficult uh, to, to do this disassociation given the constraints of the online medium. And we just, for example, we can look at how Twitter struggled to deal with, uh, with President Trump's tweets. Uh, they, long before they banned him, uh, in May of last year, uh, they started posting uh, labels. Uh, and those labels were spectacularly unsuccessful because they were unclear, they were difficult for users to understand. When the president posted misinformation about mail-in ballots, for example, uh, the label that was applied to that, uh, just below that said, uh, click here for more information about mail-in ballots. Unclear what that meant. Did that mean the president was onto something? Did, uh, was it a rejection? And every time that, that Twitter tried to do something more, uh, they found themselves uh, uh, criticized not only for not doing enough, but also for the inherent ambiguity of, uh, of, of what they were uh, posting. And what they ultimately decided was they couldn't disassociate themselves uh, other than by either uh, hiding his tweets or ultimately by removing him entirely from their service. So to me, the, the services themselves have tried. They have already said that disassociation is not possible uh, and that they are judged ultimately uh, by what they do, by market forces, uh, and, and they're held responsible for that in, in exercising their editorial discretion. So I'll just, I'll just stop there. I think we've probably beaten that horse to death. I know we have some questions from the audience. Yeah, so I'm happy to let Baron have the last word on that. Uh, so some of the questions I think we could respond to without much, without much disagreement. So for example, if a platform makes a defamatory statement in conjunction with restricting content, for example, Facebook blocks a user's content and says it did so because it contains hacked materials. This is a reference to an existing case. I, I don't wanna to speak to the facts of that case because I um, haven't followed closely enough those facts. But as a general matter, I think we'd agree that under Section 230, if a platform says, we let's take an extreme example, we deleted Volokh's account because Volokh hacked into our computers and it's false. Well, that's its own libel. They're going to be they're going to be liable for this libel because they made a statement. It's not a third party statement. It's their own statement. And they're going to be liable for it under the standard rules of defamation law. Now, if they were to say we are deleted Volokh's account because he's an idiot. Well, that's not libel because it's opinion. Likewise, if they were to say we've deleted his account because of this post and we say this post is racist. That would also be opinion because that would be an opinion based on disclosed fact, but here it is and here we're labeling it as such. So I think it's pretty clear that they would be liable. It's just a pretty rare thing. And I don't know of any case in which that. Uh, Barry, and, do you, can you disagree all, with that? All, all I would add to that, oh, that's absolutely correct. But, but, but the reason they're, they're liable under section 230 is because uh, section 230 builds in this analysis. This is a very subtle point that almost everyone misses. Right. Section 230C1 only protects you if you are the provider or user of an interactive computer service, and it protects you from being held liable for uh, information created by another information uh, content provider. But if you look at the definitions, uh, if you are responsible, even in part, this is in, in F, it's not, it's not up on the screen here, but, um, but yes, this right. term that he's highlighted, information content provider, is, is defined in, in one of the other subsections to say that if you are responsible, even in part for creating content, you become the information content provider. So C1 would not protect you from anything that you yourself create or even uh, are, are partly responsible for creating. So that's actually a very easy question under uh, section 230. So there was a question um, uh, to me uh, uh, from Mark Boyle, as a classical liberal, do you agree with all of the Supreme Court cases you cited? Uh, as you no doubt know, the Pruneyard is highly critiqued by classical liberal. Well, 
I'm not a classical liberal in the sense of a libertarian. I'm like most people, kind of a hodgepodge, right? I have libertarian sympathies, and especially when it comes to policy matters, I have a very strong presumption of, of liberty, to, to borrow a line from Randy Barnett. Um, uh, but, but it's a presumption, it's a rebuttable presumption. And on top of that, it's not my view of the Constitution. The Constitution does not enact libertarian ideals. Uh, it's the free speech, it does enact, the, it does protect the freedom of speech. Uh, but uh, it's certainly possible that uh, uh, that uh, some restrictions, even the ones the libertarians would disapprove of, would be uh, would be constitutional, uh, 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 even when it comes to speech restrictions or speech compulsions. And that's especially so when the main foundation for the objections, I understand the libertarian objection to pruning is a property rights objection, that they're private property owners and they shouldn't be required to do anything, to host anything, whether it's speech or anything else. And I appreciate the force of that argument. I just don't think the Constitution compels that. Now, as to what is the proper way of interpreting the First Amendment as a matter of first principles, hard for me to tell. It's not usually the way that I think or write. I talk about the precedents, generally speaking, because I'm more a lawyer than a philosopher. So as a legal matter, I think that certain kinds of common carrier mandates are constitutionally permissible. Now, that still leaves the question, of course, of whether there are good ideas of policy matter. And there, I'm much more uncertain. I think that there are plausible arguments for, uh, for re requiring this kind of common carriage type approach, whether for, for uh, uh, cable companies or for phone systems or for UPS and FedEx. Uh, and there are plausible arguments against it. That's an interesting question. But I do want to resist the notion that we should be interpreting the First Amendment as as classical liberals. Even if we are, it doesn't follow that the law, the constitutional law, imposes all of the libertarian restraints on legislatures that we think political morality ought to impose. Well, if I, if I may, I've spent uh, the last 13 years of my life, instead of practicing law and making a lot more money, I've spent them trying to defend uh, the ideas of liberty as applied to media and, and telecom and tech policy. Uh, and, and, I, and I do find Pruneyard to be deeply offensive. I find it to be emblematic of the radical left's approach, uh, best uh, typified by Jerome Barron's 1967 article, which uh, developed a media access theory. It was essentially the idea that the First Amendment should be a sword uh, for the government to use to uh, fight uh, uh, whatever it doesn't like about speech rather than a shield against government meddling. Uh, and I'm, I'm not alone in this view, or at least I didn't used to be. Uh, the conservative movement, uh, free market people spent decades uh, fighting government meddling in media, uh, primarily the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, when, and the Fairness Doctrine is denounced in the current Republican platform recycled from 2016. Uh, I mean, uh, this, this, is a, this is the mainstream view, or at least it used to be among Federalist Society types. Uh, and all that's changed now is that uh, a certain number of Republican politicians have decided that to, uh, to try to build their own version of the Fairness Doctrine or something actually even more radical than it. Uh, and they're now citing cases like Pruneyard. But to Eugene's point about the law and the way that the court has applied it, uh, I will only say that the court has, um, has, has not extended Pruneyard beyond uh, that kind of case. Uh, it's never been applied to uh, uh, a, a, an entity that uh, even uh, colorably counts as a media entity. Uh, and I think the only case that we have a hard uh, hard time applying here uh, and deciding how to, um, how to reconcile here is Turner. And I've already explained why I think Turner is, uh, is fundamentally different here. Uh, I don't see an example uh, in any case uh, where the ideas of common carriage uh, or, or other things uh, have been held to compel uh, a, a site that is in the business, sorry, a platform that is in the business of curating uh, to uh, not to host content that it doesn't want to host. So if I can go through a couple of more of the questions. First of all, I should mention the first question, the one about uh, platforms making their own defamatory statements. I should have mentioned it's from Sheila, excuse me, Sheila Aretsky. Um, there's a question from Kevin McCarthy. By what authority has the US government expended federal funds to provide the internet without imposing requirements of the common law of common carriage? Uh, which constitution imposes on carriers who enjoy such a preemptive public right of way. Um, well, I know of no law that says the constitution imposes such a requirement on government funded programs. Uh, the authority for the US government providing 
the original funding for the internet, uh, for, for internet research, was probably the authority, uh, essentially the complex of, of authority having to do with military preparedness. It was originally a defense advanced research project uh, agency, uh, a plan to try to deal with military preparedness, uh, create a resilient system. Uh, to the extent it's provided more funding, there's also the general funding, uh, uh, more than just for military purposes, uh, general right uh, uh, to spend for the general welfare. And I know of no cases that say once the government spends money on something, it has to provide common carrier um, rules for it. Certainly, that's not a First Amendment rule. There's a case called Rendell Baker versus Cone from 1982, which said that uh, even a school, that that case was over 90% funded. It was a private school. I think it was a school for children with learning disabilities. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it was funded overwhelmingly by the by a state, uh, but th the court said that didn't make it a state actor. That didn't require it to, to abide by the First Amendment. Certainly wouldn't make it a wouldn't make it a common carrier. So I think that is very much a matter uh, of uh, um, uh, of uh, government discretion. Now maybe maybe not even maybe the government can't impose common carrier rules on uh, even on things that it funds. It's an interesting question. But at the very least, it doesn't have to. It could say the best way of uh, of um, uh, uh, dealing of uh, uh, dealing with certain things that we support is by providing common carrier system, like with roads and railroads and such, or alternatively, not doing that. So, for example, the government provides GI Bill funds and other kinds of funding uh, for universities uh, for students who want to take uh, uh, those funds to universities. That doesn't make uh, uh, those universities uh, state actors under the First Amendment or impose on the government some obligation uh, 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 to make them common carriers. Um, another question that comes up is uh, um, uh, 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 whether subsection C2A Excuse me, this is from David Axelman. Subsection C2A seeks to, seems to impose a good faith requirement in content moderation decisions. Uh, so what about a school room for a state regulating bad faith content moderation, e.g. when a platform clearly employs a double standard? So I think if you look at the statutory text, and again, it's the current statutory text, you can ask whether, whether the statute should be changed. Look how broad it is uh, in, uh, in its authorization for the platforms. They can restrict access to material they consider to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. So there's nothing in bad faith if a, if a uh, Twitter says, for example, we believe that certain anti-trans messages are objectionable. We consider them to be objectionable and we're gonna ban them. For example, when somebody uses uh, uh, what we believe is the wrong pronoun, uh, to refer to someone or uses their pre-sex change name. Uh, whereas pro-trans messages, we in good faith believe to be unobjectionable. Uh, I think that is that that seems to me under the statute to be fully protected under the text. Again, maybe Congress got it wrong on that, but that's that's what considers to be objectionable means. Now I do think good, and there's a case on this from the Ninth Circuit, that good faith requirement might deal with situations where something is a subterfuge for um, uh, uh, for uh, or, um, uh, essentially anti-competitive conduct. When you block something, not because you find it objectionable based on its content, but because it's from a competitor and you're trying to drive the competitor out of business. Maybe, because it's true, good faith should mean something. But good faith can't mean a viewpoint neutrality requirement because considers to be otherwise objectionable, just like considers to be excessively violent or, or filthy, you know, that's something that's very much in the discretion by des congressional design in the discretion of the platform and it has to uh, otherwise objectionable, extremely broad discretion. Uh, well, indeed, I, I would say that, that both C1 and C2A are written to uh, protect the full range of First Amendment protected editorial discretion, which does not include, for example, anti-competitive conduct. Uh, that wouldn't be covered by either uh, C1 or C2A, uh, in just the same way as Eugene has explained that uh, under Lorraine Journal, 1951, uh, a newspaper uh, can be sued uh, under the antitrust laws for uh, uh, not carrying the advertisements of local advertisers who refuse to join in a boycott of the new radio station because the radio station is going to compete with the newspaper. Uh, those are not those are not protected against by the First Amendment uh, nor by uh, Section 230. 
Um, Alex, in the interest of time, uh, since I know we're about to wrap up here, I just wanted to mention, we haven't talked about it yet, but uh, Florida does have a law that is moving rapidly through the legislature that uh, that would purport to um, to create a private right of action and state enforcement uh, to deal with many of these things. Uh, we don't have time to fully address this today, but I did put a link in the chat to the piece that uh, my colleague um, uh, Corbin Barthold and I uh, wrote about this in Lawfare. Uh, and in a nutshell, I will just say that um, uh, just as you cannot use uh, consumer protection law to uh, attempt to compel uh, services to host content you, that they don't want to host, uh, I don't think that analogies to campaign finance law are compelling either. Uh, and uh, and that's relevant because while that law is not overtly a campaign finance law, it uh, it has a number of provisions that would uh, be relevant specifically for political candidates. Uh, and in particular, would uh, would seem to require, for instance, that if uh, if a social media site uh, kicks off uh, one candidate, they have to kick off uh, the candidate's opponents. Uh, and to me, uh, as we explain in that uh, lawfare piece, uh, that is essentially a reboot of the Miami Herald case. Uh, the the court has said repeatedly uh, that uh, uh, digital media have the same First Amendment rights uh, as other media, uh, as Justice Scalia said. In uh, the Brown versus EMA case in 2010, the principles of the First Amendment do not vary uh, when new technologies uh, arise. Uh, and uh, with the the outlier here being uh, Turner for its specific facts uh, and broadcasting, because broadcasters themselves are licensed by the government, and therefore uh, that is state action that allowed the government to impose the fairness doctrine and other requirements, uh, with the exception of those two things, uh, the court has made very clear that uh, Digital media have have exactly the same First Amendment rights, and we should expect that uh, Miami Herald will carry the day again, uh, no matter what arguments are being made. Excellent. Well, um, we are at the hour mark, and I I want to thank Baron and Eugene. Thank you both again for um, joining us today. This was really informative. I enjoyed it a lot, and um, at that we will conclude the session. Um, Thank you again so much and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, you too. Very, great pleasure, all the best. Likewise.